metals behave. Metals have a funny property because um, the electrons inside of a metal can move freely. So, and to a to a good approximation, you have almost as many electrons as you need in the metal to rearrange so that you have so that you can counteract nearly any electrical electrical field. As we will get into when we start talking about the energy for the electrostatic force, um, when there's an electric field, there's a difference in potential energy in the system. So everything wants to get to the same point where there's the same potential energy everywhere. So when the electrons can move freely, they're going to distribute themselves so that there's no difference in potential energy, just like water in a container is going to settle to where it has a constant level. So the electrons are going to distribute themselves so that there is no electric field, because that's what it means to have no difference in the potential energy of the surface, of, of the system. So um, when you have um, an electric, when you have an electric charge near a conductor, um, metals are, a, to a, in this class, for the purposes of this class, metals are approximately perfect conductors. Um, meaning that the electrons can move totally freely inside them. When you have a positive charge come near a conductor, um, the conductor is going to rearrange itself so that it has, um, so that there's no net electric field. So it's going to put negative charges near the positive charge, and it's going to put positive, the positive charges in the rest of the metal because the object is roughly neutral are going to distribute on themselves to the opposite side. And this is called polarization. Um, and when you, the, the whole object is net neutral. So if you were to remove the positive charge, the polarization would disappear. So because these electrons can move around, they're going to arrange themselves <coughs> such that there's zero net positive, or zero, sorry, there's zero net electric field. So here you can see what's happening. Um, the effectively you end up with slightly displaced um, centers of the charge, um, and all the charges are going to be on the surface, so that there's no net electric field inside of the object. So you end up with some extra positive charge here, some extra negative charge there. Um, the extra positive charge is going to lead to a field in this direction pointing towards its center. Remember that the electric field points where a positive charge wants to move. So the electric field in the metal in this direction is from, from this positive, this little bit is going to point in that direction because this is negative charge. So um, positive charges want to move forward here. Um, the, then you have some excess positive charge over here. Positive charges at point P want to run away from it. So your electric field points there. And if you do the vector addition, you will find that the net um, you will find that the net electric field is zero. And I dropped my stylus. Okay. So then um, if you add positive charges to a conductor, so here you have your little probe, you stick some positive at first when it's not actually touching the conductor. The, you're going to have negative charges surrounding the cavity to produce no net net electric field in here. So it's shielding the uh, the metal from the um, from the charge. And then to compensate, because the object is net neutral, you have positive charges here. Now, if you add this little positive charge to the um, to the conductor, it is going to redistribute in the conductor so that all of the positive charge is on the surface so that you have no net electric field anywhere. Okay. So then, if you want to think about what happens at the surface of the conductor, you make an infinitesimally small cylinder around it. So it's a Gaussian cylinder. So we can start talking about, we can use Gauss's law to understand what's going on. Um, and if you make this small enough at the scale of the cylinder, 
Um, this looks like an infinite plane. Um, you've got a roughly flat surface, um, and the um, because it looks like an infinite plane, the field has to be perpendicular to it. Um, so, because you can always zoom in close enough on any surface, wherever you are, the electric field is perpendicular to your sur the surface of your conductor. Um, and you have to have zero electric field here, and you have the net charge here, and you can calculate the area, um, so the flux is equal to the net charge enclosed divided by epsilon naught, which is equal to the magnitude of the electric field times the area. And you can do something similar with a conducting plate. So if you have a conducting plate in a static condition, because this is electrostatic, um, you will have no net charge build up on no net charge in the in the middle of the metal, um, and but you will have charge on the outside of the metal. And because the field is perpendicular to the surface, your field is going to point out. Uh, in this case, because the charge is positive on this, it's going to point outward. If you had a negative charge on your plate, it is going to point inward because the electric field points where a positive charge wants to move. And you can do what we have done, uh, what we did, the exercise we did before. So now you have a conducting sphere. Um, now, if you want to know the electric field everywhere for this sphere, you actually don't have to do any calculations in, when you are inside of the sphere, because inside of a conductor, the electric field is zero. Now, you can make your Gaussian surface outside of the sphere somewhere, and you get that the flux is equal to the total charge enclosed divided by epsilon naught. And because you have a sphere, in this case, your charge is all on the outside of the metal because the electric field has to be zero. So then, um, this is equal to the electric field times the surface area of the sphere, which is 4 pi r squared. That's the surface of the sphere where you are, that you are drawing your Gaussian surface about, not the surface of the sphere um, of charge. All that you're assuming, is, oops, all that you're assuming is that the, um, that the charge is distributed on the surface. Okay, so then you get the same answer that we got before, that you should now have seared into your brain, which is that the electric field is 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught q over r squared. So just like we um, talked about a few lectures back, now you have a spherical, spherically symmetrical system. So all your charges on the outside of the sphere, uniformly distributed. And I said, if you have a spherically symmetric system, um, your when you are outside of that sphere, it looks like a point charge located at the middle. The electric field is exactly the same as a point charge located at the middle. So when you have a conductor which is charged, the field inside is zero and the field outside is um, has a magnitude of 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught <coughs> q over r squared. And the field has to point out, outward, towards the, uh, outward from the center of the sphere because the system is spherically symmetric. So wherever you move, you know, your choice of origin is totally arbitrary. So wherever you move, you, it has to, this, the answer has to be the same. You could draw your coordinates differently, and you still have to get the same answer. So um, the only answer that does that, that has that spherical symmetry, 
is for the electric field to be directly pointing out from the center. Okay, so now you're going to put your, um, you're going to put a cavity inside of your metal, and you're going to put a charge in it. And when you do that, inside of the metal, charges gonna, are going to arrange themselves inside the cavity so that the, they shield the rest of the cavity from the charge. And that means that um, you have net negative charge here, which means that you're going to have a net positive charge here. And whatever this positive charge is, it's going to be distributed on the surface roughly evenly. So some of you may be wondering now, okay, well, what if I only put, what if I have one positive charge? Let's say I put only a hydrogen atom in there. How do I, I, I have charges that can, I only have an electron charge. I can't get any smaller than an electron charge. What really happens is that actually, we'll talk about this later in your physics education, they're distributed through something we call a wave function. That's how we quantify it. But the electrons and the, and the protons and everything is they're, um, they are actually moving around all the time faster than we can even measure and even define. Um, it's going to, it's the probability you'll find that charge anywhere. So the, the charge itself will still be smeared roughly uniformly on the, on the surface of the cavity because it's actually a charge distribution and not a single point charge. Okay, so if you have a cavity and you don't have anything in it and you put your charge outside the cavity, stuff is going to line up so that you have net zero electric field inside the cavity. So whatever you do, the metal is, is going to try to rearrange things so that you have zero net electric charge, electric field inside of the cavity. So here you have a positive charge and a negative charge in two separate cavities, but they are shielded from each other as well because the uh, electrons in the metal are going to arrange themselves such that there is no net electric field inside of the metal. And that's the end. Now let me talk before I close about one application of this, um, which is a Faraday cage. Um, so the electrons in a conductor are going to rearrange themselves such that there is no net electric field in the metal because anything else, and it would be, there's a difference in potential energy in the metal. So if the electrons, if there's a difference in potential energy, electrons are going to want to rearrange themselves so that all the electrons see the same potential energy, just like some type of liquid in a container. This means that electric fields um, cannot readily penetrate conductors. So you can actually shield things from electric fields by wrapping them in metal. Um, and this is why um, when you are talking on the phone, your phone, the signals in your phone are sent through electromagnetic radiation, and when you go into an elevator, if you're talking on the phone, your call will often drop because the elevator is a giant metal cage, and um, it is going to shield the, um, it is going to shield you from the electromagnetic radiation. Now, you've noticed the call doesn't always drop. That's because, um, it is an imperfect Faraday cage. It has a lot to do with the frequency of the radiation and how strong the signal is. So, um, it, it, conductors don't totally shield everything from uh, electromagnetic radiation. But this is also why you, for instance, have trouble getting cell phone reception when you are in um, especially the lower levels of Nielsen physics buildings. Many buildings are made with um, concrete that has metal rebar um, running up and down the walls of the building. And that metal rebar, it's not a solid metal, 
but it will try to rearrange the um, it will try to rearrange the electrons in um, in the metal to counteract any field that you have. So often when you are in concrete buildings that are reinforced with rebar, uh, with iron rebar, you will get worse cell phone reception. And this is something that you often have to think about in practical applications. So with my husband, we're working on trying to get beehive monitors inside of my beehives, and we want to have, um, have signals sent out through the internet, through wireless internet. And you have to worry because inside of most beehives, you have um, little sheets of um, beeswax reinforced by um, metal wires so that it's easier to inspect and harvest, inspect the hive and harvest honey. Those metal wires can act as a Faraday cage. So in general, you have to worry about wires that are separated um, on, on lengths smaller than the wavelength. So you, you do have to worry about shielding in a lot of these cases. And I, I will end with a note that that means people who run around wearing tinfoil hats, we make fun of them, but they actually, there is at least a, a little bit of gem of truth to that, that, that foil will provide some electric shielding. And that also means that if you run around with your passport, which has an RFID chip in it so that people can tell who you are um, without reading your passport, without opening your passport, you are transmitting a signal about who you are. So they actually even sell special passport wallets and you should get one so no one can steal your ID when you're traveling. But it essentially is a little, um, a little aluminum foil wallet for your passport. All right. Thanks everyone and see you for the next installment.